perform anesthesias, anesthesia for post-anesthesia care nurses. This is a seven video series on the basics of pharmacology and anesthesia techniques for the peri-anesthesia care nurse. We a group of five outstanding senior students from the University of South Carolina School of Medicine Nurse Anesthesia Program and one CRNA have created this series in the hope it will help the transition into the peri-anesthesia world. The series attempts to shine a bit of light on the techniques anesthesia uses during surgery, as well as explain the basics of the pharmacology behind our drug uses. This is by no means a series that will explain everything that happens during anesthesia, but our hope is that you, the peri-anesthesia nurse, will find our report a little less intimidating and a little more informative. After all, the better you understand the report, the better you can take care of the patient. And ultimately, this will increase the safety and satisfaction for both your patient and yourself. The group consists of Alexandra Horman, BSN RN, CCRN, Braden Seidler, BSN RN, Jordan Coleman, BSN RN, CCRN, Kelsey Squires, BSN RN, CCRN, Victoria Koch, BSN RN, and Michael Storm, DNAP, CRNA, CCRN. The videos can be watched separately, but there are some references among the videos and the basics of the pharmacology along the way. Therefore, it may be beneficial to watch the series in order. Either way, have fun and don't forget to download the accompanying handouts. These handouts are the complete transcripts of the narrations and include all relevant pictures from the videos. This video series is sponsored by Storm Anesthesia and Palmetto Health Richland Anesthesia Department. Enjoy and let's get started. Welcome, I'm Michael Storm. This is the first of the seven lectures we cover. I will be talking about the basic principles of pharmacology, which is the foundation of what we do in anesthesia. The objectives for this lecture is to review keywords and definitions, review basic pharmacokinetics, and review basic pharmacodynamics as they relate to anesthesia drugs. At the end of the lecture, you should have an enhanced understanding of routes of drug administration, the concept of compartment modeling, the concepts of distribution and redistribution of drugs, the concepts of elimination and metabolism of drugs, the basic concepts of how drugs influence the body, drug dosing principles and why, drug toxicities and their therapeutic index, receptor types found in the body where drugs act, how drugs will interact with other drugs in the body, including herbal supplements. And finally, I will cover basic sedation of patients in the PACU. First, let's cover some basic keywords and definitions. Additive effect. Occurs when a second drug with properties similar to the first is added to produce an effect equal to the algebraic sum of the effect of the two individual drugs. The shorthand used to represent this is 1 plus 1 equals 2. Adverse effect. Any noxious, unintended, and undesired effect of drug when administered in therapeutic dose to humans. Agonist. Drugs such as dopamine that attach to and activate specific receptors. Antagonist. Drugs such as naloxone, Narcan, that attach to a specific receptor and do not activate it, but instead prevent an agonist or body chemical such as a neurotransmitter from stimulating the receptor. Bioavailability. The amount of drug expressed as a percent that enters the blood in an unchanged form after administration will vary depending on the route of administration. Competitive antagonist. When the concentration of the antagonist is higher than the agonist concentration, resulting in reversal or antagonism of the agonist. Examples include naloxone, Narcan, reversing fentanyl, or fromacinil, Romasicon, reversing midazolam, Versed. 
The shorthand often used to represent this is 1 plus 1 equals 0. Cross tolerance. Tolerance to a drug because of an existing tolerance to a similar drug. An example of cross tolerance is a patient who has developed a tolerance to morphine due to repeated administration will also require higher doses of all other opioids as well. Drug. This is simply a chemical agent used in treatment. Efficacy of a drug refers to the maximum effect that can be produced by a drug. Half-life generally refers to the elimination half-life, which is the time it takes the blood concentration to fall by one half. It takes four to five half-lives to totally eliminate a drug, which is considered 98 to 99%. Hyperreactivity, an abnormal reaction to an unusually low dose of a drug. For example, patients with Addison disease, mixed edema, or dystrophia myotonica have hyperreactivity to unusually low doses of barbiturates. Hypersensitivity or anaphylaxis, a drug induced antigen antibody reaction. The particular hypersensitivity reaction can be either an immediate anaphylactic or delayed reaction. Hypersensitivity reactions can occur with succinylcholine, antibiotics, and many other drugs administered in the PACU. Hyporeactivity, an indication that a person needs excessively large doses of a drug to obtain a therapeutic or desired effect. Iatrogenic illness. Illness induced by treatment. Idiosyncrasy, an adverse drug reaction that occurs in a small number of persons and has no correlation to dosage or type of therapy. Postoperative liver dysfunction after halothane administration is an example. Mechanism of action, the means by which a drug exerts its effect on cells or tissue, usually acting via a receptor. Pharmacodynamics, the study of the mechanisms, a drug action or other biochemical or physiologic effect on the body. Pharmacokinetics, the study of the movements of drugs throughout the body, including the processes of absorption, distribution, biotransformation or metabolism, and excretion. Placebo effect, effect of the act of giving drug. Potency of a drug. The dose necessary of a particular drug to produce a specific effect designated as the effective dose, ED. When that effect is achieved in a particular percentage of patients, it is quantified as ED50 for 50% of the patients and ED95 for 95% of the patients who show an effect to the drug. The dose that will result in death to the patients is called the lethal dose. LD and is quantified as LD50 and LD95 for 50% and 95% death respectively. Therapeutic index TI is LD50 divided by ED50 and higher is safer. Potentiation. The enhancement of the action of one drug by a second drug that has no detectable action of its own. The shorthand often used to represent this is 1 plus 0 equals 3. Receptors. The portion on or in a cell, usually a protein complex, at which attachment of drugs leads to a physiologic response. The receptors are selective in that they recognize and bind only to specific pharmacologic or physiologic agents. Redistribution. The movement of a drug from one tissue to another as equilibrium shifts in the body. Redistribution is the reason some of the highly lipophilic anesthetic drugs exit the brain quickly, leads to short duration of action. Side effect. Response to drug other than intended. Synergistic effect. Addition of a second drug to a drug with properties similar to the first that results in an effect greater than the algebraic sum of the effect of the two individual drugs. The shorthand often used to represent this is 1 plus 1 equals 3. Tachyphylaxis. 
and acute drug tolerance, for example, succinylcholine administered by intravenous drip. Over time, a higher drip rate is needed to achieve the necessary response. Tolerance. A type of hyporeactivity acquired during chronic exposure to a drug in which unusually large doses are needed to reach a desired effect. A prime example is a person who has become dependent on opioids and needs larger than normal doses to elicit the desired therapeutic response. Pharmacology is the relationship between drug and body and pharmacists differentiate between pharmacokinetics, that is, what the body will do to the drug, and pharmacodynamics, which is what a drug can do to the body. Pharmacokinetics are how does the drug make it into and out of the body, think the pathway a drug will have to take before and after it exerts its effect. Pharmacodynamics are what effects drug have on the body. To remember the difference between pharmacokinetics and pharmacodynamics, you can use a mnemonic that dynamics has a D in the word, which should remind you that drug before body. Let us start with the pharmacokinetics, how the drugs arrive into and move through the body. Drugs are administered in many different ways. Each has its benefit and can be appropriate for a given situation. Certain drugs do not lend themselves to be administered via just any route, be that because of high first pass in the liver or because the drug is not absorbable via the intestines. So how does a drug make it into the body? Several different routes are available to the manufacturer. Topical, applied to the skin, PO by mouth, SL, sublingual, SQ, subcutaneous, PR per rectum, IM intramuscular, IV intravenous, inhalational through the lungs, or intrathecal with a CSF, cerebral spinal fluid, in the spine. Most anesthesia drugs are administered using the IM, IV, inhalational, or intrathecal route. Due to NPO requirements prior to surgery for our patients, these routes are most beneficial to anesthesia. After the drug has been administered, it will be absorbed into the body. Pharmacologically, we look at the body as a single or multiple compartments. This allows us to calculate how much drug is necessary to reach a certain concentration, which will give a specified and desirable effect. This is called mathematical modeling. The simplest way of looking at this distribution is to see the body as a single large compartment. This model considers a given drug fully distributed to all corners of the body instantly after the drug is given. Some IV drugs are considered single compartment drugs, for example, aminoglycosides, gentamicin, topramycin, or streptomycin. Such a drug has a fast distribution. It is considered fully equalized immediately, but also the elimination will be relatively fast and predictable since it follows a straight line algorithm. By far, the most drugs are not single compartment drugs, but multiple compartment. A two compartment drug consider the first compartment the central space, where the drug is primarily distributed. The second compartment is the peripheral space, where the drug will go next and also where the drug will be stored for a while. Many drugs are seen this way. These drugs have a slower distribution and equalization since they go to the areas with the highest perfusion called the vessel rich group first and then secondarily distributes throughout the body in the second peripheral compartment, skin, muscle, and poor vessel group. The distribution of drugs is dependent on the flow of blood throughout the body. The cardiac output will distribute its flow with most of it going to the vessel rich group, VRG which consists of lungs, liver, kidneys, brain, and heart. These organs are getting 75% of the cardiac output and at a much higher flow of blood, approximately 70 to 100 milliliters per minute per 100 grams of tissue than any other organ or tissue. The muscle group consists of muscle and skin. This group receives about 19% of the cardiac output, 
but at a much slower flow rate of 3 milliliters per minute per 100 gram tissue. The fat group is fat and bone marrow, and for this group, the blood distribution has fallen once again to about 6% of the cardiac output, and at approximately 2 milliliters per minute per 100 gram tissue of blood flow. As can be seen, the flow is falling dramatically through the groups. The VRG organs receive much more blood than any other compartments in the body. Distribution, redistribution is responsible for fast onset and fast offset of a drug. Given a bolus IV injection of a lipophilic drug, for example propofol, this drug will rapidly go to the vessel-rich group, which includes the brain. Here it exerts its effect and the patient go to sleep, induction. Propofol will quickly move away from the vessel rich group's organs and start distributing to the other compartments, that is muscle group and fat group. This rapid movement away from the vessel rich group organs towards the other compartments is called redistribution. This redistribution is the reason some anesthetic drugs have a very short effect. They move away from the organs where they exert their effect. For example, propofol is a hypnotic, causing severe slowdown in the brain. When the drug redistributes to the other groups, where there is no effect, for example, no sedative effect on the muscle or fat, the effect of propofol stops very quickly. Drugs like these require a continuous infusion for their effect to be maintained. Immediately after distribution of a drug, the metabolism and elimination begin. Most drugs are metabolized by the liver, hepatic metabolism, using a process called cytochrome P450 reactions. A single enzyme, cytochrome P450-3A4, abbreviated CYP3A4, is responsible for almost half of all drugs being metabolized. These P450 reactions are divided into a phase 1 and a phase 2 reaction. A phase 1 reaction will change the chemical structure of a drug and for the most part will render a drug less toxic, potent, than the original form. This removes most of the effect this drug is exerting on the body. Most drugs also become more water soluble and therefore are able to be excreted by the kidneys. For the drugs that could not be excreted after a phase 1 reaction, the liver will start a phase 2 reaction. Now these metabolites created in the phase 1 reaction will combine with some chemical substance and create a water-soluble compound which can be excreted by the kidneys. For a drug to be eliminated from the body, it must, for the most part, be water-soluble. Lipid-soluble drugs will have a much slower elimination since these drugs very easily become reabsorbed back into the body. Most drugs are eliminated after some form of metabolism by the liver or by the kidneys. There is also a general rule that if all else fails, drugs will eventually be excreted by the kidneys, but this can be a slow process. There are other avenues for metabolism and elimination. Some drugs are eliminated via the lungs or through the skin. Other drugs are metabolized outside the liver for example, lungs, skin, or intestines. For the most part, these avenues are of less of concern than the liver and kidney. All drugs are eventually eliminated or excreted from the body. This can happen in either a metabolized form, for example, changed by the liver, or as an intact molecule. After being metabolized by the liver, most drugs are eliminated by the kidneys in the urine, although some are eliminated via the liver produced bile. Then again, some are eliminated through the lungs or skin. The elimination half-life of a drug is a valuable parameter that gives an accurate estimate of the length of time a drug will exert its effect on the body. This is useful when we decide how much and how often to dose and redose a given drug. Although in anesthesia, we often see cessation of effect by redistribution and not half-life. Elimination half-life is a time value which represents when 50% of a drug is removed from the plasma. In other words, 
The first half-life is when the body has excreted half of the initial dose of drug. The next half-life is when the body has excreted half of the remaining concentration of drug, and so forth. In anesthesia, this is not necessarily a very useful parameter, since many drugs stop their defect by redistribution, for example, propofol. When a drug redistributes away from its primary target, the effect of the drug diminishes, but it is still in the system. A drug is considered gone when four to five half-life of the drug has gone. As can be seen in this chart, four to five half-lives equals 94 to 98% elimination. When the function of the kidneys or the liver deteriorates, the metabolism and all the elimination of drugs will suffer. Decreased renal function results in decreased glomerular filtration rate, which leads to decreased elimination of drugs. The same happens when the liver has decreased flow or function. Phase one and phase two reactions will diminish and metabolism of drugs will decrease. When cardiac function decreases, the cardiac output will often go down, which leads to less perfusion, fluid buildup, overload, and therefore a change in drug distribution. Poor cardiac function requires careful and vigilant monitoring of the patient, especially after anesthesia. Now we have covered the basics of pharmacokinetics, and I will continue on to what the drug does to the body, pharmacodynamics. Most pharmacodynamics will be covered in other lectures that are specific for individual drugs. This lecture will cover the basic pharmacodynamic principles. We believe that drugs work by attaching themselves to a specific receptor at specific places in the body. The same receptor will often give a different reaction when the receptor is located in different locations in the body. A receptor is a naturally occurring protein or protein complex that will have some form of endogenous activity. An endogenous activity is when a receptor reacts to input from the body and not from some outside actor, that is, the heart beats faster when we get scared due to release of endogenous catecholamines. Pharmaceuticals are drugs that have the ability to attach themselves to a specific receptor. After being absorbed and distributed, they search for this specific receptor and then attach to this site. We consider it a lock and key principle, where only a correctly sized key, the drug, fits into a specific keyhole, the receptor, in the lock. If the key is smaller, larger, has incorrectly positioned teeth, or is incorrectly shaped, it will not fit into the lock. Therefore, there will not be an effect of that drug on this receptor. Only when the drug finds the correct receptor will the key fit the keyhole and unlock the lock, which causes an effect. The efficacy of a drug is determined by a receptor's willingness to accept the drug to bind to it. This is called affinity. How strong the effect will be after a drug attaches itself to a receptor is called the intrinsic activity. A stronger activity means an increased intrinsic activity. When a drug binds to a receptor, it does not, for the most part, remain bound indefinitely to this receptor site. It will quickly be knocked off the receptor, but then another close-by drug will attach to the receptor instead. The drug effect is determined by having an adequate drug concentration around the receptor, so whenever the first drug molecule is knocked off, another is readily available to attach to the receptor. To reach this level of drug concentration, we must give an adequate dose of the drug and often must redose at specific intervals to maintain the effect we desire. Once adequate amounts of drug binds to a receptor, it will trigger the action. We call this a therapeutic effect. Mostly, increasing the amount of drug we give will increase the effect. 
Now, we cannot just give unlimited amount of drugs. All drugs are inherently unsafe. Basically, they are all poisons. It is the amount, the dose, of the drug we give that will determine if we primarily create a desirable effect or undesirable effects, called adverse reactions or side effects. But it is important to realize that all drugs are potentially poisons. There is no magic bullet. All drugs has multiple effects, unfortunately not just the desired effect. So we must determine how many and which side effects we can tolerate. Increasing the dose will increase the concentration of the drug in the body. This may cause some undesirable effects. If this undesirable effect is minor, we call it a side effect. For example, nausea after giving narcotics or dry mouth with scopolamine. If the undesirable effect is worse, we consider this a toxic effect. This is never what we are after. We can live with side effects, but not toxic effects. We will consider respiratory depression after narcotics or cardiac dysrhythmias confusion or psychosis after digitalis toxicities. The effective dose of a drug is the amount of drug that produces a specific desirable effect. When 50% of individuals receiving this specific dose have the desirable effect, we call this dose the ED50 or effective dose for 50% respectively when 95% of the individuals receiving a specific dose have the desired effect we call that the ED95. Given a higher dose, eventually it will be a poison and possibly have a lethal effect. Following the same principle as with the effective dose, when 50% of individuals receiving a specific dose dies, we call this LD50 or lethal dose 50%. Again, respectively, when 95% of individuals receiving a specific dose dies, we call that LD95. The relationship between lethal dose 50% and the effective dose 50% is called a therapeutic index or TI. The higher this ratio is, the safer the drug, since it will require a relatively higher amount of drug to cause death. Now let's turn our attention to what happens when a drug attaches to a receptor. An agonist drug will enhance or activate a receptor and trigger the receptor's endogenous effect. For example, isoproteronol or isoprel attaches to a beta receptor and we see an increase in the beta receptor's activity like increased heart rate. An antagonistic drug that binds to a receptor will block the receptor's endogenous effect. For example, metoprolol low pressure will block the endogenous effect of a beta receptor, like slowing the heart rate. A partial agonist drug will bind to a receptor and activate the receptor, but not to the full extent as seen with an agonist. The result is a smaller effect. Finally, an agonist antagonist drug will, if given alone, partially activate the endogenous effect of the receptor, but if given along an agonist drug, the agonist-antagonist drug will reverse some of the endogenous effect caused by the agonist drug. An example could be the newer treatment for opioid addiction, buprenorphine or Subutex. This is an opioid agonist, but much weaker than regular opioids, for example, heroin. So when given alone, buprenorphine has some opioid effect. When given after the patient has taken an opioid, it acts as an antagonist to the opioid the patient took. The benefit is that the agonistic effect buprenorphin exert will allow for suppression of withdrawal symptoms and cravings that arises when buprenorphine takes away the opioid effect from the drug the patient took. Although there is a baseline amount and efficacy of receptors, this can change. If the body become injured, for example, a traumatic spinal cord lesion, although there is not a loss of receptors, when these receptors are activated, they do not send their activated signal to the brain, it is cut off at the lesion site. Therefore, the brain treats the lack of response as if there were no receptors available and tries to increase the amount of available receptors. This is called upregulation of receptors. 
Also, chronic administration of an antagonist drug will cause the body to sprout more receptors to compensate for the diminished response of the blocked receptors. Therefore, an increased dose is now needed to keep blocking the receptors. Similarly, if we overstimulate the body with an agonist drug, the body gets tired of this enhanced response it has to produce and responds with a downregulation, removal from service of receptors. Also, some agonist drugs create this downregulation and we call it tolerance, which requires an increased dose to create the expected response. It is to be expected that patients are prescribed other medications than the ones we use during the surgery. These medications may possibly interact with the drugs we give during our anesthetic. These interactions may cause unexpected reactions, some of which may be noted in the PACU. A common drug prescribed for hypertension is an angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor or ACE inhibitor. If not stopped at least 24 hours prior to anesthesia, these drugs are notorious for causing hypotension during anesthesia. Often this hypotension is difficult to treat with our usual treatment options, for example, ephedrine and phenylephrine, and may require vasopressin bolus and or infusion. There may be changes in the absorption, distribution, metabolism or excretion, which are all pharmacokinetic changes. This can result in an altered pharmacologic response than the one intended for the drug given. The changes may be of pharmacodynamic nature, where giving one drug will change the effect of another drug we give during anesthesia. Examples include adding a vasoconstrictor to a local anesthetic. This will slow down the absorption of the local anesthetic because the vasoconstrictor reduces the blood flow in the area where the local anesthetic is injected. This will ultimately prolong the effect of the local anesthetic because it takes longer to remove it from the tissue. If a patient takes Maalox or Mylanta, which are aluminum containing antacids commonly taken over the counter, will reduce the absorption of drugs like tetracycline, digoxin, phenytoin or chlorpromazine. This could be cause for diminished effect of those drugs. At the same time, Maalox and Mylanta will enhance absorption of pseudoephedrine and levodopa, which will cause an increased effect of these drugs. Grapefruit juice significantly inhibits ZIP3A4 reactions. Remember, this enzyme is responsible for almost 50% of all metabolism of drugs by the liver. This will increase the concentration of those drugs, for example, antifungal drugs, TB drugs, SSRIs, and some antibiotics. Other drugs, Paxil, Prozac, and quinidine, inhibits another enzyme, CYP2D6. This enzyme is necessary to convert codeine to morphine. Therefore, when CYP2D6 is inhibited, codeine, oxycodone, and hydrocodone will not have their intended effect. Certain antibiotics, for example, the aminoglycosides tobramycin, gentamicin, and streptomycin, as well as the polymoxins, corticosporin, and triple antibiotic ointment, inhibits the release of acetylcholine from the presynaptic membrane. This will intensify the neuromuscular blockade caused by a non-depolarizing neuromuscular blocker like rocuronium and vecuronium. This will make the reversal of these drugs difficult. A feared reaction among opioids is the response seen when a patient taking a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, an antidepressant, and we then give the patient meperidine, Demerol. What happens is that Mayo inhibitors increase the amount of two catecholamines, norepinephrine and serotonin, in the nerve synapses by blocking the breakdown of these catecholamines. This will increase the amount of available norepinephrine and serotonin in the synapse. Serotonin is a monoamine neurotransmitter in the GI and CNS synapses. The normal cycle is for serotonin to move back into the cell after its use in the synapse. This is called reuptake. Meperidine is a, all by the week, serotonin reuptake inhibitor. Therefore, when we have created an increased amount of serotonin in the synapse with the monoamine oxidase inhibitor, 
and then meperidine starts to block some of the reuptake, catastrophe is set to happen. We call this a serotonin crisis or serotonin syndrome. This can be mild or very severe. We differentiate this reaction in two types, type 1, an excitatory phase with headache, agitation, muscle rigidity, and fever, and a type 2, which is more of a depressive character with hypotension, respiratory depression, and coma. Monoamine oxidase inhibitors are very slow to be eliminated from the body and can stay around for up to three weeks. Patients on chronic steroid treatment, which for this purpose is defined as more than 5 mg a day for more than three weeks, has an inadequate ability to increase their own production of steroid as needed. This lack of response is not a drug-drug interaction, but it could be the cause of hypotension, respiratory depression, and delayed recovery, which may be noted in the PACU. The goal in modern-day medicine is to continue the patient's normal dose regime, but if the patient has stopped taking the normal dose, it is recommended to treat with hydrocortisone pre- and post-operatively. Only if the surgery is long should it be considered to give an intraoperative dose as well. Many patients take herbal supplements. It has been estimated that between 20 and 35% of the general population takes one or more herbal supplements. None of these are FDA approved or regulated. Many of these patients, upwards 70%, do not report that they take herbal medications. Most do not consider these to be medicine, so they don't feel a need to inform their healthcare practitioner about these drugs. Many have not told their surgeon about these supplements either. These herbal supplements can interact with the drugs we are using during anesthesia and in PACU. It is generally recommended that to refrain from these drugs for one to two weeks prior to surgery. There are a few exceptions, for example, valerian, where an abrupt discontinuation could cause withdrawal syndrome, very much like benzodiazepine withdrawal. This drug is recommended to be tapered off slowly. These herbal supplements are giving us the most complications. This list is just a condensed version, and these herbal supplements could have many more uses and complications than listed here. Ephedra is used for weight loss, congestion, and bronchospasm. The main issue is it can cause dysrhythmias, hypertension, bronchodilation, which is mostly a good thing, diuresis, and tachycardia. Recommended to stop for a minimum of 24 hours. Feverfew is used against headache, fever, and migraine. It inhibits platelets, causing bleeding issues, causes insomnia, and anxiety. Recommended to stop for at least one week. Garlic is used for hyperlipidemia and atherosclerosis. Can cause increased bleeding times and increased fibrinolysis. Recommended to stop for at least one week. Ginger is often used against nausea, vomiting, and motion sickness. It can increase bleeding times and should be stopped at least one week prior to surgery. Ginkgo bilboa is advertised to improve memory, help with dementia, and peripheral vascular disease. It also increases bleeding times and may inhibit platelets. Recommended to stop for at least 36 hours. Ginseng is often used to improve concentration help with hypoglycemia and stress. It can increase bleeding times, cause insomnia, irritability, mania, and interact with digoxin, warfarin, and lithium. Recommended to stop for at least one week. Cava is for anxiety, stress, and insomnia. It may potentiate barbiturates, inhibits platelets, and generally potentiates anesthetics. Recommended to stop for at least 24 hours. St. John's wort is used as an antidepressant and a sedative. It inhibits CYP3A4, which is an essential enzyme to metabolize drugs in the liver. Recommended to stop for at least five days. Valerian is used as a sedative against insomnia and as a muscle relaxant. This will potentiate sedatives used for anesthesia. Should be tapered off over two weeks of time.
It is not uncommon for PACU patients to require sedation to avert the stress. The noise in the PACU, be that from alarms, agitation of other patients, loss of control, confusion, or pain will all increase the patient's stress level and may warrant sedation. Stress can cause increased oxygen consumption due to increased heart rate, blood pressure, and exacerbated hyperglycemia. Remember, stress from surgery has already increased cortisol level, which causes hyperglycemia. When deciding to sedate a PACU patient, it is paramount to consider what was given during anesthesia. Many of the anesthetic drug or gases will still have effect in PACU. Well, that is the reason that goes to PACU in the first place. Therefore, it should be obvious that any sedation of the patient should be done gently and with a vigilant eye towards adverse effect of the sedation. It is strongly recommended, although not a standard, to use some form of sedation scale. There are several useful scales available. For example, Ramsey is among the oldest going back to the 70s. MOAS or Modified Observer's Assessment of Alertness Sedation Scale. The Sedation Visual Analog Scale. Or PAS, the Pesero Opioid Induced Sedation Scale. Either scale could be beneficial to the PACU nurse. We hope you have enjoyed this first lecture in the series. We have created a seven lecture series covering many techniques used in anesthesia. We have specifically focused on the need of the PACU RN and hope you will find time to view the other six lectures as well. The lecture series includes this lecture, Basic Principles of Pharmacology, and the following six lectures, Inhalation Anesthesia, Non-Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Opioid Intravenous Anesthetics, Neuromuscular Blocking Agents, Local Anesthetics, and Regional Anesthesia. All lectures are available on the Palmetto Health Intranet, as well as on stormanesthesia.com forward slash education forward slash PACU forward slash PACU videos.